I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I've been reflecting lately about situations in which, understandably, we care about other people and we watch them uh, not making progress, maybe, in, in areas where they're um, upset or things are not really going for them. And so we, we try to help them. And I, I say as a therapist, uh, also, often you're in situations where people are asking you to, to help them escape from inside a kind of cage that they're weaving themselves. But as you make efforts to kind of pull apart, you know, the cords and the ropes and the bars of their invisible cage, uh, out of habit, they struggle with you about that. And so what to do? It's a central topic in any kind of a helping profession, uh, uh, whether it's formal psychotherapy, let's say, or coaching, or more informal efforts to help other people. And it also gets to the question of, wow, turn the mirror around. Am I, you know, also, am I resisting in some ways the help that I'm trying to give myself? And I don't mean resisting like, oh, that's bad. I mean resisting like, oh, that's what minds do. All right. What can we do about that? And so that is a lead into a very deep topic about what does it mean actually to make your own life, to have your own life? You know, as I came home from an errand earlier today, I was passing a, 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 a cemetery on a hill near where I live, and I was just reflecting on both how, how beautiful it is that there are markers for the lives of the people there, tombstones of various kinds, and also how real it is that as real and important and tangible and intimate as my own life is to me today, right now, as I drove by, the lives of those people who are gone whose bodies are decaying, perhaps cremated, uh, they're not here anymore. And that end inevitably faces all of us. Not to be morbid about it, but to be insightful and grateful for the extraordinary opportunity of a precious human life and faced with the fundamental question of what, what shall we do with it? What shall we do? The Buddha had a lot to say about this. He said, first of all, there is, and the word is dukkha. This is the first noble truth. Ter uh, poorly translated commonly as suffering, a bad, bad, bad translation. Dukkha. Dukkha means simply that uh, some experiences in life are unpleasant. Second, that even pleasant experiences all end eventually one way or another. And third, it is the nature of all experiences to be made of parts that are connected and changing and thus insubstantial and so that no single experience is capable of providing lasting happiness. That's dukkha. There is dukkha. What shall we do about that? There is also tanha, the second noble truth, commonly translated as craving. When we apply tanha to dukkha, that equals suffering. On the other hand, if we can allow experiences, as we did in the meditation, to arise and pass away, some of them we like, some of them we don't like, some of them we neither like nor dislike, if we can simply be that way without clinging or grasping or resisting, um, then we have dukkha without tanha, which is equanimity, and a deep and luscious inner peace. How to do it, though. And there is also the world with its meadows and its swamps, its highs and its lows, um, its praise and its blame, right? Its gain and its loss, its fame and its ill repute. 
its pleasure and its pain. What do we do about all that? It's your life I'm talking about here. What are you doing with all that? What am I doing with all that? The Buddha had a lot to say about this. And his own life is a demonstration of a kind of answer, a kind of response to the question of what shall we do with the reality of things, including our own aging and our relationships and our own hopes and dreams and our own commitments to social justice and helping others. What shall we do? He lived and taught at a time when one of the dominant spiritual wisdom strands of his time uh, emphasized uh, rituals of various kinds and turning to priests of various kinds to perform those rituals to benefit people in the hopes of a favorable rebirth in the future. And the Buddha really shook his head at that. And he said, and here's a quotation that I've already put in, and I'll put it in the chat again. He said, no, not because of the social caste you're born into and not because of empty rituals that maybe you have others perform for you. That does not make you holy in a, in a broad and very honorable sense. Deeds alone make one low. Deeds alone make one holy. He emphasized to an extraordinary degree uh, the importance of deliberate, personal, intentional practice with thoughts, words, and deeds. And he opened up his teaching community to anyone who would um, follow the rules. And with some prodding, he even opened it up to women, which was unheard of in the time. So how can we focus on, as he says here, uh, what can we do? What can we do ourselves? So I want to talk about three major themes here. First theme is how to help yourself. Second theme tonight is how to help others help themselves. And then the third theme is how to help the universe help you. Okay? So with regard to helping ourselves, and this has really landed for me today especially, uh, the first suggestion I have is to take existential responsibility for your own life. And it's very real. It's your life. It's this life. Uh, I had a time in my life, in my mid-20s, when I actually contemplated ending my life. Uh, I had become fairly depressed, and I had become shocked that my own misery, uh, that misery could come upon me so powerfully. And if it could come upon me today, it could come upon me tomorrow. What shall I do? So I really reflected on that, and there was a very specific moment. I know where it was, I know what was happening about it, when I suddenly realized with reflection that I had been always ambivalent about being in life altogether. Maybe some part of that was spiritual and did I really want to come into this body? Maybe some part of it had to do with a birth process. Don't know, but I do know I was ambivalent. I was kind of holding out for the last battle. I was still deciding whether to get into the pool. And that ambivalence uh, was actually a factor in my own depression of the time. And there was a very clear moment for me where I reflected on all this and, and got in touch with the ways that I'd been kind of really holding back about uh, entering into life fully. And I, I made a fundamental choice to fully step onto the game board while reserving the ride with excruciating, intractable terminal pain, you know, to exit. But meanwhile, I'm in. <laughs> I was about 25, maybe 26, 25 at the time. And I'm in, you know, I stepped into the game with all of its swamps as well as its, its meadows. That was a moment of existential responsibility for me. Have you had similar moments yourself? 
you might like to share about those in the chat. If you do use the chat, remember, focus on your own experience, your own practice, and what's useful for you. Feel free to be supportive of other people, but don't give advice. Don't try to educate other people. Um, definitely don't criticize or sell other people. Okay, so taking existential responsibility for your own life. It helps to appreciate that it's your life and no one else's. No one can do your work for you. I want to bring in another quotation here from the Dhammapada. Now you can relate to what I'm saying here as a kind of pep talk, <clears throat> and that's okay. But most importantly, take a look at it yourself. What Perhaps you have already really claimed that existential responsibility for your own life. But you might take a look at the margins where that claiming has not been complete. Sometimes we think that, well, I'll just do this tomorrow. Or we think that, well, rescue might come. No, no one is going to rescue you. It's not going to happen. That longing for a perfect world, the longing for a just world, the longing for a good parent, the longing for a good big sister, big brother is completely normal, completely sweet, very understandable. And it will not be fulfilled. Rescue is not coming. In most fundamental ways, you're on your own. We live in a field of relationship. We can certainly open to support of others, but in so many fundamental, profound ways, you're it. You know, as um, a very wise person once said to me, you belong to you, to no one else, really. And that can be a very challenging thing sometimes to face. And there can be sometimes a kind of grieving in it. Wow, rescue is not coming. I'm really on my own in a lot of ways. And yet when you step into that, it kind of frees you actually to be even more deeply centered in your relationships. For one example, if you help yourself, you know, if you practice for yourself, you then develop more inside yourself that can be of benefit to others. This is particularly important if you're a person who's been socialized for various in various ways to put others ahead of yourself. Nothing I'm saying here is about uh, becoming arrogant or selfish, conceited, even sociopathic. No, I'm just saying basically that um, Ultimately, the person we most need to count on is ourselves. And can you yourself be someone you can count on for yourself? Can you count on yourself to be a good friend to yourself? To be a wise guide? To be supportive and kind and encouraging? And as you develop these qualities in yourself, remember that you're going to be helping other people too. So, so far, in my suggestions here to consider, in terms of taking existential responsibility for your own life, I've talked about the fact that it's your life, pure and simple, nobody else's. No one can do your work for you. Rescue is not coming. And helping yourself helps others. I want to add that in this can be doubt. People can be insecurely attached to themselves, in effect, and they can doubt their own trustworthiness. And this is where I think it's important to consider taking a chance on yourself, in effect. And you don't know. You don't know exactly, but if there's one person you need to trust in this world and take a chance on, it's yourself. And I want to put two quotations here, one from Jimmy Chin, uh, movie director and great rock climber, and Goethe. 
Jimmy Chen writes, the two great risks are risking too much, but also risking too little. That's for each person to decide. For me, not risking anything is worse than death by far. Can we take the risk of saying, you know, I'm going to take a chance on me. I'm going to give it a whirl. I'm going to take a chance on when I take responsibility for my life that I can be reasonably successful at it. I'm going to take that chance rather than avoiding complete and fundamental responsibility for my life so that whatever happens, you know, it's not my responsibility fundamentally. Instead, I'm going to risk the consequences of taking full responsibility for being at cause in my life rather than regarding my own life as being endlessly at the effect of everything that's happening to me. When I take that chance on taking responsibility for my own life, you know, I'm willing to give it a whirl because the alternative is even worse. And even as Goethe puts it, as soon as you really trust yourself, how to live becomes increasingly clear. Oh, I didn't push, sorry. I have to push the return button. I have to take responsibility for pushing the right button that puts the quote in the chat sidebar. Quotes, plural. So Melinda asked a question at one minute past the hour. How is this any different from a kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps? Um, obviously, uh, we are very much affected by social forces around us, including structural forces that impoverish people or keep them down um, uh, in order to advantage others unfairly. Absolutely true. All right. That said, in the givenness of whatever one's life is, if we don't claim a fundamental kind of agency, for our own life, a fundamental responsibility for our life, then we're endlessly at the effect of those social forces. We can both recognize that we're at the effect of racism or sexism or structural conditions of various kinds, class conditions, wealth inequality. Uh, we can recognize all that while also saying most fundamentally, you know, I have a I can take a fundamental responsibility for my own experiences and my own mental training and the choices and the, and, and the values that I have in this life. You know, the one is not inconsistent with the other. In fact, the more that um, the world is mistreating you, the more that the world is unjust and unreliable, the more that we need to rely upon ourselves. Relying upon ourselves does not give injustice a free pass. Part of relying on ourselves is to trust our own judgment about when it's appropriate to speak truth to power and to call injustice by its name. My second headline here about um, helping yourself is to use the power that you do have which also relates to my response to the excellent question that I just spoke to. And what does it mean to use the power that you do have, right? Typically, it's lots of little things that each day add up to something big over time. You may have heard me with this quotation. It's one of my favorites. <clears throat> Think not lightly of good saying, it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. So the question for you as I get increasingly practical here is, okay, all right, what's the power you do have to make your life a little better every day? For example, I was in a meeting earlier today with someone with a healthcare professional and the health care professional was helping my friend with a problem my friend has. 
And the professional was recommending a treatment that involved two things that actually my friend at the time did not believe in or want, but my friend did not say so. And we ended the, the meeting, the appointment. There was no more opportunity to talk to the healthcare professional about this. And my friend was pretty dissatisfied with that meeting. And yet, having been in the meeting, I could tell that if my friend had spoken up, the professional would have been very receptive, would have listened, would have been interested, and together the two of them might have been able to shift the treatment plan in some way. My friend did not use the power that they actually had in that setting. Um, I, I've had situations where I'm driving my long-suffering wife and I tend to zoom along and uh, she doesn't like it. Well, I can claim the power. I can use the power I do have to drive more moderately in a way that doesn't, you know, accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate in a way that raises her blood pressure. I can use the power I do have, right? So what's the power that you do have to um, make your own life better? You might ask yourself, huh? Like, do you have the power to meditate? Do you have the power to exercise? Do you have the power to eat and drink more wisely? Do you have the power to get yourself to bed a little earlier and sleep a little uh, longer? Do you have the power to do these things? Can we use that power? Um, a second thing that the Buddha talked about, besides the power of lots and lots of little things, was, wow, the, the importance and the power of training and using a well-trained mind. Going back to the question that came up a moment ago, um, we have pretty limited power typically to change the world around us, including other people. But we have a lot of power to train and use a well-trained mind. From the Dhammapada, wonderful it is to train the mind, so swiftly moving, seizing whatever it wants. Good it is to have a well-trained mind, for a well-trained mind brings happiness. No mother, nor father, nor any other kin can do greater good for oneself than a mind directed well. And people ask me, well, don't, don't you need some precursors to that? Don't you need to have some, let's say, self-confidence or self-esteem um, or a belief in your own power? I actually think not. I think we just have to choose to use the power we have. Like, for example, do we have the power to deliberately pay attention, attention to a single breath from beginning to end? Yeah. Do we have the power to not interrupt somebody who's talking? even though we really want to. We have that power. So we sometimes think, oh, and you know, I need to have prerequisite X or precondition Y to be able to use the power that I do have. But what that does is block us from using the power we do have. And to the extent that we're afraid to use the power we do have, because understandably, we've been punished perhaps or seen others like us being punished for using the power they actually do have, you know, understandably, if we have that fear, then the mind can look for rationalizations or pretexts or justifications for not claiming the power that we actually do have. And we can do a lot of emotional work that's good, sometimes in therapy, mostly usually for most people outside of therapy, to clear some of those fears. But a lot of what really helps, frankly, is to take existential responsibility for your own life and then as the responsible agent inside your own being, take a look at certain things you believe and consider if they're actually true. And if they're not true, let that knowing land inside you and act upon it. You know, that has a certain tough-mindedness. That was the Buddha's path. He looked into his own mind and he looked out into the world. He recognized what it was true and he acted upon it. That might sound super rational or heady or something like that. It's totally not. It's about feeling and knowing what's true, right? We can know that we can use the power we do have because we watch other people using similar powers and they're fine. We can know that it's okay. 
And then on the basis of knowing that, only you can reach for that power and use it. So training the mind, really, really fundamental. We're training the mind here. We have many, many opportunities to train the mind. How are you training your mind these days? Bit by bit. One thing in particular you're focused on, I'm uh, <clears throat> focused on working with exasperation. Whoa. <laughs> Even covert exasperation. And so increasingly it's released. It doesn't even arise. You know, that's that's a thing. Um, that's a thing. It's not the only thing I'm working on these days inside myself, a work in progress. Um, what are you training? You know, it's very positive. For me, you know, I feel like I'm giving a bit of a pep talk at halftime in the locker room to a bunch of people who are worn out. Oh gosh, Coach Rex, shut up. But to me, what we're talking about here, what I'm trying to, is incredibly hopeful and positive and affirming, especially of people who have been pushed around and made to feel powerless. Okay. Another thing is to make choices. <clears throat> Avoiding choice is a choice. There's no escape from the fundamental uh, fact of choice. So the Buddha, again, really emphasized that. And it was related to him emphasizing the importance of volitional choice, deliberate choice. So one of my favorites uh, is, you know, I'll say it like this. Wisdom is, um, you know, choosing a greater happiness over a lesser one. That's the first quotation. That's a choice. You know, we're bombarded with Lesser happinesses, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll, you know, getting angry at other people, um, procrastinating, you know, these are sort of happinesses of different kinds. But often what they do is they crowd out the greater happiness. What's good crowds out what's great. What might be the greater happiness that your heart longs for that you could choose increasingly? Also, um, as the Dhammapada put it, you know, we're the protectors of ourselves, right? We can make choices to regulate ourselves and to practice sila, you know, which is restraint and morality and virtue, uh, non-harming. All these are aspects of sila, one of the three pillars of practice in Buddhism, the other two being training the mind and the development of wisdom. Um, yeah, what maybe what desires that are problematic for you would are you working on these days? Helping yourself to um, let go of you know these desires can be really obvious. Like uh, I want the third fill in the blank, you know, drink, cookie, TV show, late into the night. Okay. But there also are pleasures of different kinds or rewarding experiences like, you know, one that I kind of work on is um, proving that I'm right with other people. You know, there's certain pleasures in that. Can we watch out for that? All right. Okay. And then this last quotation of, of the a translation of the Buddha's last words often translated traditionally in a very poetic way as be a lamp unto yourself. He didn't really use words like that. I like Stephen Batchelor's point. You know, things fall apart. In other words, all formations, all conditions are impermanent and you know empty. They fall apart. Things fall apart. Tread the path with care. Care meaning both lovingness, heartfulness, and also care in the sense of conscientiousness. These are choices. Do we, can we choose to walk our path with care each day? What kind of care have you brought to your day so far? What kind of care could you bring to the remainder of the day? Just in the beautiful sense of care, like, you know, uh, a mother cat cares for her kittens. You know, 
someone who cares for a, a plant. You know, let me prune it here and water it there. What's it like to bring that tenderness to the rest of your day? To how it is to, to sleep through the night or wake up from time to time? And then how can you bring care to, you, to your day tomorrow? And then last, really important here, in terms of helping yourself. And these are not the only ways, but these are some headlines for me. You know, take existential responsibility for your life. Use the power you have. And then third, surrender to what is good within you. You know, so can you make room for and trust in your own sweetness, your own goodness, your own talents? your own natural longings, all right? That's a way to help yourself, to kind of give over to and be lived by the good that is already within you. What is that good that's already within you? Yeah. Rather than underestimating it, can you live more being true to it? especially if you've been, like I have been a lot of my life, alienated from what is good in myself. Uh, I did a recent podcast with Forrest, uh, the Being Well podcast. Uh, you'll be able to hear it if you like, probably within a few weeks, on uh, the Jungian notion of the shadow, and which included, as Jung pointed out, what he called the golden shadow, those aspects of us that are really beautiful and good and full of creative potential that for various reasons can get pushed away. Well, can we reclaim some of that golden shadow and be lived more and more by it? Okay, so that's the first theme. The second theme is to help others help themselves. And I wanna stress a point here that you cannot help someone who will not help themselves. You can try, you can love them, it can break your heart. A very dear friend of mine um, has an adult child in the hospital right now, uh, recovering from yet another relapse into heroin addiction. Whew. Tons of treatments, rehab, programs, and relapsing again. And I don't mean this in a moralistic sense. I mean it in a very pragmatic sense, just factually. You cannot help people who will not help themselves. Now, maybe they'll help themselves tomorrow. Don't know. But it's just simply a fact. You can open doors for them. You can create conditions for them. You can keep them alive long enough for them to finally find a way to help themselves. But ultimately, they have to help themselves. Uh, by the way, uh, the Buddha's last words are posted up above in a three-part posting of a quote. And things fall apart. Tread the path with care. Great. So it's very useful to know that we cannot do other people's work for them. And to know that any kind of help we give them has to be grounded in what is true. One of the things that happens when we try to help people who won't help themselves is sometimes truth is a casualty in that whole process. So it's important to be grounded in clear seeing about the ways in which they continue to weave, you know, the cords of their own in invisible cage. But don't let that knowing fuel a coldness or a laziness or an indifference. Right, to other people, it's really easy to get righteous here about other people. And I don't mean that. I'm talking about a kind of a sweet spot that has a realistic recognition of the ways in which we have very limited power with regard to other people. And um, then with our own good heart, uh, and I wanna add another quotation here from Mason Williams, the father of Lucinda Williams, 
one of my favorite musical artists. Beautiful quotation. So first the Buddha, with goodwill for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart, a kind of field through which others move, including others who are limited in their helpfulness for themselves. Above, below, and all around, your heart can be unobstructed without hostility or hate. Or as Mason Williams puts it, have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. So we can rest in this feeling, this stance, this attitude, while also really looking for best practices that guide relationships. Best practices, practical wisdom, like not having family secrets, not what's called triangulating, in which um, third parties start getting involved in a conflict between two people in ways that are not helpful, but actually function to maintain the conflict in some ways. That's not a best practice. Uh, listening deeply to other people that you wish well and listening deeply with compassion sometimes that's one of the most important things not giving advice not problem solving not um, helping them to evade responsibility for their own life not perpetuating some fantasy they might have that you will rescue them or somebody else will you know listening deeply uh, and receptively avoids those pitfalls other best practices, encouraging the truth to emerge. Someone tells you, if you ask them, well, when will you see the doctor? And they go, ah, so much pressure. I don't want to answer that question. Okay, maybe you back away or maybe you just are interested in truth. Like, oh, oh, okay. Um, what do you experience with that? Or what's that? What, what in that feels like pressure, right? What, what's the pressure feeling? Do you feel pressure in other places in your life? I'm not saying we have to be therapists, but very often we could ask the next question or the question even after that. And as Jimmy Chin puts it, take the risk, of course. But, um, you know, we can support truth emerging even if it's kind of risky. There's a saying, truth or harmony. And often in relationships, we deliberately choose and wisely choose harmony. You know, maybe we don't want to bring up certain issues with people. It's not the time and the place. We don't really have the basis to bring it up. Okay. But in important relationships, people who choose harmony over truth again and again, very often end up with neither. truth, making room for their responsibility, disengaging from fruitless efforts to change them, stepping out of helping, you know, stepping out of um, asking them how you can help them, which shifts the responsibility over to you. Uh, as a longtime therapist, you know, I, I would also often look at what I call the responsibility ball in the office. And if I, as a therapist, am, am taking more responsibility for their well-being than they are taking for their well-being outside of very specific emergencies when it's appropriate to step in. But in general, if I'm taking more responsibility for their well-being than they are, that's a clinical issue. That's a, that's a problem in the therapy that needs to be adjusted and dealt with, right? And then with all this comes a kind of grieving sometimes. I'm seeing examples of people talking about loved ones 
that you try to help and they just won't receive the help or they won't help themselves. And there can become eventually a kind of disenchantment, which the Buddha really appreciated and acknowledged. Not a sort of um, fooey, disgust, meh, but more like waking up from the spell of or the unrealistic thought that you can do more than you actually can with that particular person. And there can come a kind of grieving with that disenchantment. Like, oh, oh. But, and we, because grief can come with it, we can resist that disenchantment, that clear seeing. But that just kicks the problem down the road one day at a time. Um, ultimately, it's better to, you know, stand on the tall mount- mountaintop of truth. The air might be thinner there and it might be colder up there, but the view is tremendous. Ultimately, that's better than being kind of down in the humid swamps of well-intended twirling with other people. And then last, to finish up, uh, and so much that could be said here, can we also, so far I've talked about one part of the truth, which is us, you know, using our executive capabilities, using our own capacities as an agent, a chooser, an active force in our own life. Okay? I've been speaking about that. And not getting excessively sucked into other people's lives in our well-intended efforts to, to help them past a point that's effective. Up to the point that's effective, great. We all need help. People have really helped me along the way. Thank you. But past the point that's effective, not. The last one here, the other side of the truth, though, is that we're part of a universe that can help us. And I'll drop in a quotation here from Shohaku Okumura in his incredible book, Realizing Genjo Kuan. Take your time with it, and it's amazing. He basically speaks to the two truths. We participate with the whole universe as it practices through our individual bodies and minds. Fundamentally, <clears throat> we don't practice individually to improve ourselves. Rather, we settle down peacefully within the network of dependent origination, everything related to and causing everything else, the network of dependent origination, and allow the universal life force to practice through us for all beings. This is a fundamental shift. Both are true. There is a place, as the Buddha, particularly in early Buddhism, really emphasized, deliberate, intentional, volitional practice, taking responsibility, using the power you have, helping others, but always realizing that they have to make their own way in this life, fundamentally. Much as you are fundamentally on your own, they are fundamentally on their own as well. And there's a limit to how much help you can provide, particularly to people who will not help themselves, particularly in certain areas, okay? That's true. But the other side of the truth is that we are lived by the universe altogether. We are a wave in the universal sea. Yeah, we have our own individuality in some sense, even as we are being made by the whole ocean, uh, whose nature altogether is water. That's the truth of things. And you can ask yourself, how could I surrender more to the universe altogether? You know, as Alan Watts put it, you didn't come into this world. You came out of it like a wave from the ocean. You are not a stranger here. Isn't that beautiful? So you might ask yourself two truths here. On the one hand, this kind of relates to my last talk two weeks ago about the two great movements of the heart you know, coalescing and dispersing, gathering and dispersing. 
There's a gathering, which is what I've talked about mainly so far, in which we guide and direct ourselves. That's pretty much a lot of what early Buddhism is about. And then with more of the Mahayana, of Tibetan, Chan, and, and Zen Buddhism, there's more of an opening out and a being lived by everything. If you want to know how to save the chat, can somebody tell uh, M. Angel? I believe you have to go down to some of the widgets in the chat window at the bottom, I think, to save the chat. Uh, we can also save the chat and all the quotes. We'll post the quotes. I'll send you the quotes. Yeah, there, maybe Zoom has changed its feature. Fear not. We will send the quotes to you and share them. I want to bring forward a couple more quotes, and then I want to finish up here. So there is the truth of individuality, and there is the simul truth of universality. John Muir in this quotation here speaks about this in a very naturalistic way. That's really, really beautiful, right? Thich Nhat Hanh also, bless his memory, bless the memory of John Muir as well, um, says this in his own way. In terms of practicing, we have again a beautiful teaching grounded in the work of Dogen, the great Japanese Zen master. Here again in Shohaku Okumuras, who's a Zen master himself, incredible book. This integration of totality and individuality is the way we actually live and the reason we must practice the two together. I could not leave tonight without mentioning this other part of the truth, universality. And then there's this beautiful image from Zen Buddhism. Although the boundless moonlight is reflected in each drop of water, we must still care for the drop. The drop being an individual life, trembling and quivering there on the tip of the leaf until it falls. We must care for it, care that word again, even as the boundless moonlight of allness is reflected in that drop, the two together, the individuality of the drop, the universality of the moonlight shining in all directions. And so you might ask yourself, wow, how could I give over more to the universe altogether? How could I recognize more um, the ways that I am being constructed continuously by all that is? How could I release the contraction of self to find the humility that appreciates that endless constructing of ricking or billing or Martha Ng, or Carla Ng, right? How can I do that? How can I do that? That's an ultimate kind of practice. And curiously, interestingly, what I find as people claim existential responsibility for their life and use the power they do have and disentangle from dead end ugh, efforts with other people, um, as they do that, really interestingly, in other words, as they, <coughs> protect me more and stand up for me more and take responsibility for me more, including their impact on other people. That's not left out of taking responsibility for ourselves. As they do that, a peacefulness and an integration grows and grows in them that supports a kind of secure attachment with the universe altogether because we find a secure base in ourselves in the first part of what I've talked about here relating to attachment theory, we become then increasingly able to venture forth, to go to explore outward uh, into the universe altogether. Uh, finishing here, um, this is a quotation from Dogen that hit me right between the eyes uh, on a retreat I was on nine months or so ago. And it really shifted a lot of things for me. <clears throat> You can ask yourself, you know, 
how do you practice in this life? So staying focused on the teaching here, I will send you the, uh, quote, the quotations uh, from Dogen. Conveying oneself toward all things to carry out practice enlightenment is delusion. So he's, Dogen is, is pointing out that the presumption of being a separate self who is taking existential responsibility um, and using the power you do have, if you leave it only it's that, you tend to perpetuate uh, the, the sense of being a separated, isolated self at odds with the universe, trying to prevail upon it, which is a sure prescription for suffering. If that's only what you do. You need to do that part, as Shohaku Okamura points out. We need to do that part while also recognizing the other part. The other part being all things coming and carrying out practice enlightenment through the self, through you, is realization. And there's a very palpable, it's not conceptual, it's a very palpable experience of shifting from one to the other. I think there's a place for making things happen, for top-down approaches, and in my experience, most people do not fully claim existential responsibility for their one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver puts it. There's a lot of opportunity there, while also a lot of opportunity for knowing that really you are the moon in the dewdrop. Really, there can be a kind of trusting the universe, a kind of falling backwards and letting life live you. And in these ways, all three of them, helping yourself in the ways that you can, enabling others and supporting others in helping themselves, and letting the universe help you in these three major ways, we can be involved in a beautiful, wholesome, adventuresome, amazing, miraculous life. May you have that life. May all beings have that life.